Greetings everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes, my name is Phoenix. If you have been here already, or if you are new here, and you're enjoying what you are listening to, please make sure to hit that subscribe button, and then set your notification bell to all, that way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you can buy me a coffee, or if you're not a member, you can find all that information in the description below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crazy X Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. I'll read the first story an ad will play, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I would like to make something abundantly clear in the beginning of this. I was very naive in my youth. Very naive. While my ex was emotionally, sexually, and mentally abusive, he was smart enough to never lay a hand on me physically. He used gaslighting, manipulation, and carefully hidden sadism to control me for eight years. I forgave him for every slight against me, every instant of cruelty, every mental assault, and every sexual attack. I forgave him because I thought he loved me and that I was his property because we'd been together for so long and I wore his promise ring. In my mind, I was dealing with actions that would eventually grow away with age. I was 17 when I finally got the courage to leave him, and since then, he's left me messages on Facebook, my phone, my email, and called me from texting apps to be a breather. It's always the same message he leaves. I'm still here. Every month, like clockwork, same time, same day, same message. He has done this for over six years, and I could do nothing about it. He wasn't breaking any law, so I couldn't report him, and nobody cared about it anyway. So I blocked each account and continued on with my life. But two months ago, the messages stopped completely, and I know why. I got engaged to another man the same day he messaged me for the last time and posted about it on Facebook, and magically, the messages stopped. He stopped because I'm going to marry someone else and, in his mind, am no longer his property. This is the only thing that makes sense to me, that he believes I belong to the new man and not him. But I have the feeling I've not seen the last of him. So to my crazy ex-boyfriend of eight years, I hope I don't run into you again. Last fall, I met a girl on Tinder, thought it was too good to be true. She was beautiful, gave me her Snapchat, and I didn't realize to what extent she had problems with until much later. As I am out of a car, I mostly walk to campus for my classes, from an apartment only about a 10-minute walk away. I enjoy it. I get my steps in. Anyway. This girl decides to basically move in with me for two to three days a week at any time. My roommate doesn't even mind at first, but as her true colors are shown over the next couple of weeks, it's clear that she has some major issues beyond being a bratty 19-year-old drug dealer. She begins to be rude to everyone, and I mean everyone, as long as she was sure that she was out of earshot. She insults my sibling for being non-binary. She insults and makes fun of elements of my family, despite my personal feelings. Every time she would visit me, it became clear I was only good for two things, sex and potential buyers. With the exception of alcohol and marijuana, I've been clean for years now, and I'm quite proud of that. She would call me late at night to complain about personal issues that she clearly could have prevented if she had been more careful or even remotely cared about her family or was not perpetually high. 
She takes bong rips while driving, claiming it makes her drive better. She drives terribly to begin with, by the way. Even calling me after T-boning someone in a parking lot and failing to exchange insurance information with someone in a previous fender bender. Even not even telling her parents or family after one, pretending her insurance issues were taken care of and lying to her family once they got a whiff of her situation. She would also frequently mention her ex and derail entire evenings while checking social media to check up on him while she was with me. Once this guy got a new girlfriend, she started messaging her and started threatening her as well. So far as her mother had to get involved, and to this day I am unsure whether she has a restraining order against her now, as she eventually told me about. I couldn't joke with her. We came from two different worlds. I'm 24 and come from academia, with my family being writers, scientists, lawyers, etc., She's a 19-year-old and, well, a drug dealer who lives with her grandma simply because she refused to find common ground with her mother, who, as far as I can tell, simply didn't want her selling drugs in the first place and simply would not put up with her defiant attitude. She is incapable of listening and unable to accept or even hear the lightest or criticisms. Disclaimer. Her dad is legitimately a terrible person. Since November, I don't think I've had a conversation with her, in person or otherwise, that wasn't completely one-sided. While she'd rant about something trivial that could have been solved with a few words of civility and compromise, it would take her hours or even days for her to register that I was upset or not feeling well. It came to a point where I was either too uncomfortable to open up to her, or even too scared as on occasion she let me know when I wasn't behaving manly enough, such as when I use my satchel instead of a regular book bag when I get ready for school, or my love of musical theater, show tunes, and what have you, thusly low-key projecting a level of toxic masculinity. I'm a straight guy, comfortable with his own masculinity. I have nothing to prove, nor do I have anything to hide. She would go out of her way to make me feel horrible about anything in my life she didn't like, such as when my kitchen needed a sweep or I was behind on dishes on a weekday after classes. Every day, people issues. Even going as far as to take tweezers to my eyebrows without my consent, as I didn't look right. Getting closer to the present, she constantly berates me for not having a car. I pay rent, go to college full-time, pay bills and whatnot. I can't afford one at the present. I'm okay with that. I've worked hard in my academic life as well as worked on my mental health to be in a place where I'm doing better that I was, say, you know, a few years ago. But apparently, what little I had and what little I've gained is subject to ridicule, and I don't have any say in the matter. Recently, she's taking up the N-word in her everyday vernacular to my horror and disbelief. I'm lucky enough to have friends tell me that this isn't right, and I've been listening to it for a little over a year now. She's rude, distrustful, and I'm simply a toy to her. I can't tell you how glad and lucky I am to have friends like this that tell me I'm way too good for her. One friend in particular has been telling me to leave her in October. I should have listened. I'm 24, an undergrad, far from home. I'm just lonely, I guess. Despite my loneliness, I do have my boundaries. I once got yelled at for breaking a Snapchat streak and multiple times for leaving her messages on read for more than half an hour due to school or a commitment of some kind or even something that demanded my focus. And even, in one case, leaving my computer on while I was out with a Facebook tab open. Anyway, cut to today. My roommate is out. I'm alone. I have been ignoring her for three days. Her last message to being to the effect of she wants her stuff 
So here I am, pretending not to be home on a Sunday. I left her stuff in a box outside my door. The lights were off. I'm staying away from my windows, despite being on the second floor. Again, history of mental instability and prone to violence. Relying on natural light and turning off my thermostat to pretend I'm not here as I type this to pass the time. Every little sound that isn't a tick from the clock is met with a mild lump in my throat. She could even have come by already and taken it. I don't know. I haven't checked. I probably won't until tonight. Until then, I'm going to shudder in the cold while I jump at every noise because she is violent and crazy and I have no desire for a confrontation of any kind. I just want to start out by saying this story occurs over a couple of years. It has been a long time, but it is really hard for me to type this out because it still makes me very anxious to this day. Some of the time frames are a bit cloudy for me. When I was around 15 or so, my mother reconnected with an old crush of hers for her junior high school days, Wayne. Soon after, they started dating. At the time, I thought it was pretty cool because I actually went to a school with his son, same grade as I was, Brandon. He had two other kids as well, both younger, James and Allie. I didn't actually see Wayne very much at the beginning, as he and my mom would often go out or go hang out at his place. One night, I got a phone call from him sometime close to Christmas, asking what I would like for a gift, which I thought was strange because I barely even knew the guy. But I just assumed he was trying to get on my mom's good side, so whatever, moving on. He started coming around more, and I remember just Something about him sent alarm bells off in my head, like you would not believe. He just gave me this freaking heebie-jeebies feeling. Wayne moved in very soon into their relationship, and I just chalked up my uneasy feelings about him to him and my mom moving too fast in their relationship. Fast forward some time. My mom was working at a liquor store, and I was home alone with Wayne. I can't remember what this was over, but we got into some sort of heated argument. I was young and full of teenage angst, so who knows. Next thing I know, he headbutts me, and I was so shocked. I didn't know how to deal, so I told my mom, but nothing happened. Eventually, he managed to convince my mom to quit her job because he could financially support us, and she had back and knee issues, so she agreed. Then shit started to get fucking weird. I suddenly got a peeping Tom who would appear into my windows late at night in the summer. I would notice because I saw someone or my neighbor would see someone, etc. At one point, someone saw him taking pictures of the inside of my bedroom. Not sure if I was home or not. Police were called, but of course they can't do anything if they can't actually catch the guy. I was terrified. To this day, I am so uneasy, sleeping if windows are low. Wayne took action and convinced us he could take care of the family. Wow, such a hero. He convinced my mom to get a security system, which cost a fortune that had to be paid monthly. He convinced my mom to get a dog, Coda, she was the bomb, to keep us safe. Turns out, Wayne had hired people to look into my window. In the winter, I could see footprints all the time that led to my window. I did not learn that this was him until much, much later. I am not even sure how we found out. He started to get physically abusive with my mom, me, and worst of all, poor little Coda. I used to just hold her and cry because I felt so bad for her. We felt totally trapped financially and felt scared of who Ever this dude was that was peering into my windows at night. We were scared. We were absolutely fucking terrified. One night, Wayne didn't come home. My mom called him over and over and over 
and he would not answer his phone. When he did arrive home in the wee hours of the morning, his clothes were ripped. He was dirty as all hell and covered in blood. Wayne claimed he got mugged. Not long after this incident, freaking homicide detectives show up to my house. He pushes me away and tells me he will speak to them in private. Upon his return, he comes up with some story about how it had to do with a neighbor of ours going missing, that they were doing door-to-door -door checks looking for any information, and that they won't be returning, and there is no need to worry. A couple of weeks after this, a truck was found abandoned and they found a body. There was a murder. The accused was a neighbor of mine. Honestly, it has never been proven, but there was no doubt in my mind that Wayne had something to do with it. Ah, and here's where we learn Wayne has a crack addiction. He was a huge dude. You'd never guess by looking at him that he had an addiction to drugs. Hence why it took so long to figure out. It all came to a head one night. He and my mother started arguing. I heard banging coming from the bedroom and I went running to save my mom. I found my mom huddled in a corner in her tiny ass bathroom, him on top of her just beating her away. I screamed and grabbed at him, begging him to stop. He then turned on me, grabbing me by my neck, pushing me up against the wall by my neck and punched the wall directly beside my face. He let me go and I went running. He had purchased an old timey battle axe that happened to be sharpened and it hung on our wall. He grabbed it and started chasing us with that axe. I thought we were going to fucking die. Now, just to note, my mother tried calling the police when they first started arguing, but they didn't come. As he was chasing us with this axe, I dialed 911 on my phone. I was screaming, blubbering, begging for them to come. In this whole mess, I don't know how he stopped or why, but he just left. Once the cops got there, he was gone. He did get caught in charge later on. We, of course, got summoned to testify in court. My poor mom was too scared to testify, so she refused. We still had to go to court, though. We saw him in the courthouse, and he gave my mom and I the most sinister fucking grin I have ever seen. He was pleased with himself. He felt no remorse. So, honestly, Wayne, I hope I am never so unlucky that I have to see you again. This isn't so much one encounter, but it was a terrifying experience. I've never told this story to anyone besides the police, but I've been thinking a lot about it lately and only recently realized how much the whole thing really fucked me up. So, here goes. I met this guy at a bar one night. We had a great time, partied all night and eventually ended up back at my apartment. After that night, he basically lived with me instead of the hostel he was staying at. We clicked right away, and I enjoyed having him there. We dated for about three months before the first night he attacked me. It was the night of my 30th birthday. We celebrated, had a blast, and passed out at about 3 a.m. He had told me he suffered from PTSD and night terrors. He had woken up many nights freaking out. I was deeply passed out when I awoke to five quick blows to the head and face. I tried to cover myself not knowing at all what the fuck was happening when I realized my arms were pinned at my sides. He was sitting on my chest with his legs on my arms and strangling me before I had any idea where I even was. I only remember the light fading and going black as he squeezed harder on my neck. When he let me go, the blood eventually rushed back to my brain, and I remember seeing him walk to the bathroom. At that point, I grabbed my dogs and ran to my car and took off. He must have passed back out. He called me hours later, completely confused as to where I went. I told him everything he had done, and he promised me he didn't mean to do any of that. He would never do that on purpose, and he promised to seek help. 
I agreed to come back on the terms. If he even scared me again, he'd be gone. Exactly one week later, again in my sleep, I woke up to him on top of me, but not doing anything. I slowly pushed him off and pretended to be getting ready for work. Out of nowhere, he jumped up and sucker punched me dead in the mouth. I fell onto the bed and he again tried to strangle me this time. I didn't fight and pretended to pass out. He let me go once he thought I was passed out and went to the kitchen. As soon as he left, I grabbed my dogs again and booked it to the car. I jumped in the car and locked it. This time he chased me. That was when I realized this wasn't some PSD nightmare, sleepwalking freak out. He was a full-blown psychopath. He was awake and very coherent. He was screaming that he'd burn my house down if I didn't come out, trying to break the windows to get into my car. As soon as I got the doors locked, I called the cops. He went back inside. When the cops arrived, I told them he's crazy and might try to attack them. When they went in, he was quietly waiting for them and went with them without any resistance. He knew what he had done. It wasn't until during the trial I found out that there was a knife in my bed. When he let go of me and went to the kitchen thinking I was passed out, he went to go get a butcher's knife and left it on the bed when he chased me outside. No one can prove what he was planning, but I am convinced he was going to stab me to death. He wasn't charged with anything in the end because the DA pulled some fancy luring maneuvers and tricked him into walking right into the arms of ICE as soon as he left the courthouse. I have to say, that was satisfying to watch. He was deported and banned from the country. He still tries to contact me on social media by making new accounts to try to get me to help with his appeal to be allowed back. <laughs> nope. He still claims he wasn't awake for any of this. I don't know what I believe, but I know I feel a fuck ton safer with him on the other side of the globe. I've been having a hard time sleeping since then. I kind of brushed everything off and carried on with my life as if nothing of this magnitude ever happened. Thinking about it recently, I realized being attacked in your sleep and coming that close to possibly being a murder victim might cause some everlasting psychological damage. I am considering seeking help. I think maybe sharing this story for once might be a healthy first step. During college, I dated a fairly well-known and talented local musician named Tim. As horrible boyfriends tend to be in the beginning, he was a loving, attentive, charismatic, seemingly normal partner. He made me mixtapes, cooked me my favorite meals, and dedicated songs to me at open mics around town. I, young, foolish, and naive, was deeply smitten by his mysterious, dark, artistic allure. However, over the course of our one-year-long relationship, his mental health severely declined. He had the ability to appear lucid and normal around other people, but in private, he began suffering delusions, compulsively lying, and creating art that focused on themes of rape and murder. I was worried sick, and his condition was exhausting, but I did my best to be kind, understanding, and supportive. I loved him and believed that he shouldn't have to struggle with his mental illness alone. One time he vanished without a trace for a full day. I found his apartment empty, lights on, front door wide open, phone on his nightstand. I took a few deep breaths and called all around the city for hours before finally discovering he had been involuntarily checked in to a mental hospital. I did my best to be strong for him seeing him every day during supervised visitation hour, bringing him his favorite books to pass the time, and holding him as he sobbed that it was all a mistake, that he did not belong there. It was surreal to see my gentle, intelligent, 
normal albeit depressed boyfriend surrounded by visibly insane long-term psych ward patients. For real, the place was like something out of a horror movie. In retrospect, none of the staff ever told me the real reason why he was there, and I was too polite and naive to ask. Our relationship ended a few months later. I found undeniable evidence that he was cheating on me and, secretly relieved, confronted him. I told him to leave my apartment and never come back. He cracked. The gentle Tim I had known and loved melted away to reveal a new persona with dead, wild animal eyes. He threatened to kill himself with pills unless I took him back, but I was so extremely done that I called the police. They weren't much help, but Tim left. I blocked him everywhere and never contacted him again. But he left me insane voicemails from different numbers for weeks afterwards. I was relatively unshaken and things returned to normalcy. I graduated and got a sweet job in the same cool college city. Six months later, I woke up to concerned texts from mutual friends saying that they didn't want to freak me out, but Tim was off his meds, clearly manic, and was posting a newly written song all over social media. His best friend, who hadn't been in touch since before the breakup, sent me an apology along with a screenshot of the lyrics. That got my attention. I won't copy-paste them here because they'll lead me back to his band camp, but the song was pretty explicitly about my rape and murder, but in a sort of clever, disguised way. It's catchy too, the bastard. I checked his profiles myself from a friend's account, and he was posting dozens and dozens of totally insane, rambling statuses, most of them about me. They flip-flopped between flowery love, prose, and murder imagery. His friends were reacting with concern, but a few egged him on, probably thinking he was just venting about his ex. I decided it'd be best to continue ignoring him, but I saved screenshots, just in case. A few days later, while at work, I looked up from my computer to see Tim enter into the far side of the studio. My blood turned to ice. He was talking to my creative director. It looked cordial enough, and I saw Tim begin to casually scan the studio. I ducked down and bolted into my favorite project manager's office, slammed the door, and unleashed upon her what must have been a nearly unintelligible explanation of what was happening. I was shaking so hard I could barely speak, but Nancy was amazing. She understood almost immediately. She snuck me out of the building and drove me in her car to the police station, where I showed officers the screenshots and filed a report. My co-workers later told me that Tim was there to inquire about the open designer position. He is not a designer. He had brought with him a portfolio and an elaboratory fabricated work history that sounded legit. At the end of his interview, he casually asked if I still work there. He said we used to collaborate. Oh, and he had a written song for me, and it had been picked up by local radio this morning. He asked my co-workers to let me know with warmest regards. That phrase still makes my skin crawl. He then left, found my abandoned car in the parking lot, and paced behind it until the police arrived. Unfortunately, he wasn't enough of a public menace for police to bring him in that day. But the incident helped me to secure a restraining order against him. My company was amazing, too. I was deeply embarrassed about my literally insane ex coming to the studio, but the CEO filed trespassing charges against him and created an action plan to keep me safe if it happened again. Not long afterwards, I moved to a different city, and that was that. Haven't heard from him since. But I discovered the most alarming part later. His roommate at the time, Liz, went through a similar experience with him during his breakdown. 
and when we compared notes much later, she said she had seen a large axe in Tim's car the same week it had all gone down. She said that she was worried about Tim's Facebook activity, so she removed the axe and hid it. Tim was so angry that he completely trashed their house and never came back. And if our timelines are correct, that must have been just before he came into my workplace for his interview. So this story I'm about to tell just recently happened, but to connect all the pieces correctly, I'll have to tell a little bit of a backstory as well. So I'm a 26 year old gay man and a few months ago, I got a message and friend request from my ex. This ex was my first when I was 16, and he was five years older. Long story short, he dumped me right before Christmas. He claimed he couldn't handle the age gap and completely shut me off. I was devastated and had a six-month-long depression after this happened. I was only 16 at the time. So, I haven't heard from him in ages, and the random times I would stalk on social media, I never found anything. A couple years ago, I did find his Facebook page and saw a few posts from family members, and it almost looked like he died. I assumed suicide or something similar, and actually kind of forgot about the whole thing. Then, I received a friend request and a message. Me being a nice person, I decided since I was completely over him, I would engage in the conversation and see what happens. Everything was normal for a situation like this, and he explained he went to jail for a few years, and I won't really go into details for privacy reasons. After chatting for a little while and catching up, we stopped talking for a while. Nothing unusual either. Then, a few weeks ago, he started messaging again. This time, something seemed weird. He was talking about relationships and getting very upset over details about my current relationship. I thought this was extremely odd and kind of stopped chatting back. Suddenly, there were posts on social media and mass texts that he needed help. He was getting kicked out of his apartment. But the odd thing was he was just moving to another apartment. After a few more random text messages ranging from I need help, I can't handle life, come hang out on my rooftop, and just condescending updates online. He finally asked why I hadn't responded to any of his help requests and how he thought I was better than that. At this point, I was really annoyed and decided I would just end this. I told him I don't think a friendship will work out and I was glad to catch up and wished him the best. No response. I figured he got the message and was going to just not respond. A few days passed and still no response. I deleted his messages and moved on. Two days later, I noticed a flower on my porch. I don't think anything of it and continued on with my everyday life. Then I noticed some other odd things. Around my house, some of the plants were pressed down like someone stomped them. It was only around my bedroom window and my bathroom. My backyard looks over a farm and woods, so I never had my curtains closed. Thinking this was odd, I never connected the two together. I figured an animal must have laid down there or something. A couple days later, when I came home later in the evening... I noticed the power was off to the house. I noticed a storm headed for us, but it hasn't hit yet. Plus, we don't normally lose power. I pull out my keys and open my front door, leaving my car in the driveway instead of the garage. I live in a really safe area, so I don't even bother locking my car. Inside my house, the curtains were all pulled shut, and it was semi-dark. With no power on, the air was starting to get stuffy. I put down my stuff in the kitchen and headed to the basement to check the power box. Walking down the steps, I heard a loud noise on the other side of my house. But I didn't stop as I have cats and they tend to jump and run around. 
Everything was on, and nothing looked odd about the electrical box. I walked back upstairs and, at this point, saw a figure out of the corner of my eye. I froze. My mind raced, and my only thought was to act natural-like. I hadn't seen anything. I faked a little sneeze to make up for my sudden freezing. I quickly pulled my phone out and texted my friend, 911, help, and quickly called her. She didn't pick up. Damn it. I casually left a voicemail. Um, hey, I just got home. I have no power. Um, hey, I just got home. I have no power. Um, you and Dave are fine to still come over if you'd like. Just come in the back door. It'll be open. I tried to sound casual, but off for her. Dave is actually her father, and we've never called him by his name unless she was telling stories about his time in the war. She also wasn't supposed to be coming over that night either. I casually walked to the back door, trying to watch my entire surroundings. I didn't see anything or hear anything. I started to think it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I go to unlock my back door, which is also locked, and the screen door is always locked. Both were unlocked. Trying not to panic, I just opened the door and let the screen door open. I slowly turned and try and think of something else I can do that might casually get me out of the house quickly. As I am standing in my kitchen thinking about making a run for my car, I hear a loud bang outside. I jumped and ran to the front door. Nothing. I look over and saw my car interior lights on though. Did someone just break into my car? I turn around to grab my keys from the kitchen when I saw something moving in my living room. I don't know what I said. Hello? As soon as I said it, I wanted to kick myself. I slowly moved to the kitchen to grab my car keys and run, but they were gone. How were they gone? This was all that I remembered before I was waking up in my bed, all the lights on in my bedroom. It felt like a truck had hit me. My entire body was sore and heavy. My eyes slowly focused on the room, and I managed to pull myself into a sitting position. What the hell happened? I thought. I slowly stood up and searched for my phone. It was on the kitchen island. The time said 2.23 a.m. I quickly searched through my text messages. Nothing. That was odd. Feeling a little less groggy, I checked my doors, windows, and all the rooms. I don't fully know what happened that night, but there was no evidence of someone being in my home. I didn't sleep the rest of the night and honestly felt like I was a bit crazy. The following morning, however was a different story. I had finally fallen asleep sometime after 4 a.m. and woke up at 8 a.m. to a text message on my phone. It was a random number and it only said, Last night was fun. We should do it again. With initials after. I just froze. They were the same as my ex. I immediately texted back, What did you do? but I got a message back saying number, not valid. I never heard anything again or had any weird occurrences again. Hopefully, I never do. In high school, I had a stalker. Here's the story. I'll try to keep it concise, but there's a lot of information for sure. I was 16 and we met on Facebook. He went to a school nearby and we decided to meet up for a movie. We had a great time together and ended up dating. First time he came to my parents' house, he had an ankle monitor on for house arrest and wouldn't tell anyone why. Red flag number one. And since he was a minor, we couldn't find out. My parents obviously didn't allow us to hang out, so we hung out at his house or around at the YMCA camp. I was rebellious and naive. 
Things started to get weird when I noticed his family was pretty odd. One day, we were having sex in his bedroom, and I saw his father looking through the blinds. I screamed and called him out, and his dad ran off. Stalker guy told me that his dad was just into redheads and liked to watch us. So this wasn't the first time for this dude. I went to leave and his mom was doing crack in the kitchen. So I decided it was time to break up. This was when it got bad. He started crying and told me that he's in cancer treatment and that's why he needs me. He doesn't have long to live, blah, blah, blah. I believed him and told him we could be friends. This is when the stalking started. He switched schools to my high school, but never went to class. He would just stand outside of the classroom looking inside until it was a passing period. When I would leave class, he wouldn't address me. He would just follow me for about 10 to 15 feet behind me to my next period and stand outside the classroom again. I was too intimidated to say something to him. He was 6'4 and a heavy set guy. So I just let it happen for weeks. It started to progress to where he would follow me home every day. He would get on the same bus as me, despite living across town, and walk 10 to 15 feet behind me all the way to my house. He would stand outside just staring up at the window until around the time my parents got home, and then he would just leave. Finally, I told him to fuck off and leave me alone. I told him we could no longer be friends or acquaintances and to forget about me. However, that escalated things way further. I started getting about 150 calls a night. Half of them were him screaming death threats and in detail torture methods that he wanted to do to me. And the other half were him singing me love songs that he wrote on his guitar. Every time I blocked his number, he seemed to just magically get a new one and leave more messages on that. I woke up one day to see that overnight, he had left me one of those dancing, singing snowman things on my porch. He had stabbed it in the head and the knife was still sticking out. He covered it in his liquid deodorant that I had previously mentioned liking the smell of, and I noticed there was a hole where the little song recording device was. When I pressed the hand, it was not the regular Frosty the Snowman song that played. It was his voice singing eerily, I'm going to have you forever. I'm going to let you be. I was done at this point and told my parents, who contacted the school. They suspended him, but he still waited at my bus stop every day and walked to my home with me. One day, he ran at me like he was going to tackle me. When I tensed up for the impact, he stopped and hugged me. It wasn't a regular hug. It was like he was trying to crush me. I was 5'1 and about 90 pounds at the time and he ended up cracking one of my ribs. I cried and he started crying too before running off. He left me a voicemail apologizing in song. This one night is the night I'll never forget. And it's the reason we got a restraining order and my dad got a gun. I woke up one evening for no reason, just was fully awake. I got up to go to my kitchen to get a glass of water to relax, and in the reflection of my fridge, I saw movement in the backyard. I couldn't see well because it was so dark outside and so light inside, so I went to the back sliding glass door to get a better look. When I got closer, I was met with the silhouette of a six-foot-four man standing just outside the door. Stalker guy was in my backyard, under my room at 3 a.m. He was just staring at me. I yelled and my parents got up, but he was gone by the time my dad went outside. There was a patio right outside my bedroom window that goes all the way to the ground, so it's possible he could have been on top of the patio looking directly into my bedroom window before. We got a restraining order granted shortly after that, 
and the stalker guy dropped out of school. I haven't seen him since in person, but every six months, ish, he makes a new Facebook and tries to friend request me. I just block it and report it every time. Some scary shit. Y'all ever heard of that myth that if you wake up in the middle of the night for no reason, there's likely someone looking at you? Well, maybe it's true. I don't know what he's doing now or where he went, but I don't care to know. So, to the scary stalker, leave me the hell alone and let's never meet again. This all happened when I was 19. I'm not the best looking dude, so I've never had much luck with the women, and I ended up on Tinder. I wasn't having much luck there either, until like the third month of using it, when a blonde woman named Katie messaged me. She was pretty enough that I just dismissed her as a bot. It wasn't until three days later that she messaged me again, which was odd because bots almost never message more than once. I clicked on her chat and replied, then looked at her profile. What I saw was pretty generic, but definitely wasn't a bot's profile. We had been talking for like a month when she proposed the idea that I come see her. I was pretty reluctant as she lived nearly eight hours away from me by car, but I had to admit I really did like her quite a bit and I had been thinking about asking her if I could come see her for a while now. After a bit more badgering from her, I finally said that I would take the drive to go see her. At this point, I had no reason to doubt she was who she said she was. We had video chatted every other week and called most days. I just assumed I got really lucky. Things did get a little weird on the way there, though. She kept messaging me, asking me where I was and making sure I was still coming. At some points, when I took more than 30 minutes to respond, she'd send me a slew of annoyed texts. Admittedly, I had chalked this all up to her being nervous about me coming to see her. I was pretty nervous too, so I couldn't blame her. I had a hard time finding the house at first. The directions she gave me were pretty confusing, and it was back through a series of gravel and dirt road and a large thicket of trees. It was about midday when I came onto an old looking house. A window on the second floor was boarded up, but it didn't look abandoned, just worse for wear. Katie's red buggy that she liked to talk about was parked in front of the garage. I took out my phone and texted her that I was here. She only sent a smiley face in return. We sat down on her couch and started talking about our plans when I asked her about her dad. Uh, you didn't tell me your dad was here, I said. Was that going to be a surprise or... Katie looked confused and told me that her dad wasn't there. I still thought she was keeping up the act and I told her that she didn't have to keep pretending and that I had seen him looking at me through the upstairs window. Katie went pale and said that we had to get out of there now. We both ran to our cars and when I questioned Katie, she informed me that her dad wasn't there and that she had been home alone until I showed up. I called the police and while I was on the phone giving them the address, Katie gasped and pointed to the window where I had seen the guy last. He was looking at us from out of the window again. I got a better look at him and he seemed older and frail, almost like he hadn't eaten anything in a while. He left the window after he saw that we saw him. The police took half an hour to show up and the whole time Katie was crying and mumbling about how she was an idiot for not keeping her doors locked. When the police finally did show up, one started asking me and Katie questions and the other two searched the house. They came back out a little later and told me and Katie that, while they didn't find anyone, they did find that the back door was hanging open. Whoever it was had run out into the woods, but the cops were sure the house was empty. 
After the cops left, Katie asked me to stay the night because she was too scared to be in her house alone right now. I gladly did and we slept downstairs on the couch as Katie's bed was the next room to the one the man had been in. Katie had also brought out a shotgun that her father had given to her but she never used. I told her it was fine. The man's gone but she insisted, saying she felt safer if we had it out. I'm glad she did. Later that night, I was still wide awake watching TV. Katie had somehow managed to fall asleep. From the kitchen, I heard the sound of a doorknob being turned. At this point, I wasn't even scared. I was just pissed. I flipped on the light in the kitchen and pointed the gun at the kitchen door. And then there he was. The guy that had been in the house before was standing on the other side of the glass door. He looked shocked, and I'm glad we had locked the door. The man unfroze and yet again ran into the woods. I woke up Katie and told her what happened and called the police yet again. When they arrived, they did a sweep of the woods and found no one yet again. They told Katie and me that it'd probably be a good idea to stay elsewhere for the night. Me and Katie said our goodbyes. She was going to stay at her friend's house and I was going home. I left a little after Katie did. I was on the phone with my brother telling him about what happened. My headlights were on. As I was talking, something caught my eye. The fucking man was standing at the corner of the house just watching me. I gunned it out of there and didn't even bother calling the police again. But I did text Katie. She said she was going to call them again. I don't think Katie ever even went back to that house alone. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true crazy X stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.